Hello, everybody. I, I hope you can see the three of us and you are back from, from your break. This is the interview or the in, on stage interview session, this time with Ana Lopez Carr, monitoring and evaluation specialist at Direct Relief, and Andrew Schroeder, who is the vice president of research and analysis at Direct Relief. We have been doing these on stage interviews since the first Spatial Data Science Symposium. I think. They are always very, very exciting, but also a little bit nerve wracking. So um, we have a couple of questions that we would like to discuss with Anna and Andrew, and hopefully that will be quite exciting in its own. But please also feel free to, to ask additional questions in the, in the Q&A. Well, Anna, Andrew, maybe because many people here may not know you, you can walk us a little bit through your, your daily routine your daily work at direct relief and maybe we can even use a, an event that is on on many of our minds for instance how you reacted to the to the crisis to the fires in hawaii sure uh, maybe i could give a brief background on direct relief and then andrew if you want to go ahead and talk about the maui fires uh, we could do that um, so direct relief is a humanitarian organization um, we're located in Santa Barbara, California, um, and we are focused on health and medicine. We provide material and cash support for health clinics and other health focused organizations um, that are, you know, that support uh, um, and do their work treating the most vulnerable patients. We're active in all US states and territories, as well as in over 80 countries around the world. And in addition to providing this day-to-day -day medical aid, we also respond to major emergencies and disasters, both domestically and internationally. Uh, we do this through material and cash support, as well as by providing data analytics for situational awareness on the ground. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Anna. And, and in the case of the uh, wildfires in Hawaii, I mean, it, it's an interesting example of kind of the layers that we have to go through in order to figure out what kind of assistance to deliver to which people at the right time, at which time. So uh, this was an extremely fast moving event. So we get um, emergency alerting that comes through a variety of different channels early on uh, that indicates, uh, you know, everything from uh, observations of people that are posting to Twitter to, um, you know, the National Weather Service and other kind of forecast models. In this case, the fire just like went faster than anybody had time to react to. So uh, we were just catching up with everyone else as we sort of see, as we saw sort of like the speed of and the scale of this impact that was virtually a 100% uh, destruction in the town of Lahaina uh, and then some surrounding areas. We begin to monitor uh, evacuation. We look a lot at population movement. So this is a displacement event uh, where people were uh, leaving from the area. They go to other parts of, of Maui. They leave the island altogether. So we have to track those uh, dynamics because that's one of the principal sources of uh, humanitarian need uh, as we sort of look at these um, displacement events over time, we begin uh, kind of correlating that to on the ground health uh, needs. So uh, we you know, go back and look at like, what is affecting the people of uh, Maui uh, to begin with. Uh, there's a major indigenous population within Maui. Uh, there's sort of the history of uh, US empire for want of a better word within, uh, within Maui that has um, uh, a lot of significant implications for health. There's age implications um, and disease patterns. We look at health infrastructure and then uh, connect that up with what is going to be a sort of serious shortfalls in access to medicines and medical supplies over time, and then send teams in after all of that so that we can begin getting a sense of where we need to grant. We need financial resources. We need uh, to put money into long-term change so that we can uh, sort of help with the recovery effort. So uh, all of those various pieces touch on things that we do basically day to day for any number of things. In this case, it was one of the fastest we've had to deal with. So what impresses me working with you guys is that I do a lot of tech transfer with other companies and they are old school in many fashions doing things by phone and in spreadsheets. You're really a, a tech company as well, so to speak, while you're being a relief organization, right? So what is the, the benefit 
for the work that you're doing for, of geographic information systems and data science more broadly? Well, um, yeah, I'll start. Um, I think understanding humanitarian risk and vulnerability is inherently a geographic problem. So we're always asking where the most vulnerable people are, um, whether that's people at risk of not receiving the basic care they need or those that are in the way of a natural disaster, or maybe those that are at risk of contracting uh, an infectious disease that is spreading, right? We wanna know where all these events and are happening and where people are and what their needs are. Um, so GIS and data science tools are fundamental to answering those questions and also to managing those large data sets required for the analysis. Um, yeah, I think all of that's right. I also think like uh, something I learned um, a while ago from Jack Dangerman was uh, the idea that GIS is an integrative technology, that it's uh, about, you know, connecting different uh, areas of data through space in, in a way that allows us to deepen our thinking about issues. So, you know, we're looking simultaneously at demographics, at uh, disease, at the built environment, uh, how the, uh, kind of access to health services uh, changes over time, given different kinds of uh, events. We're looking at uh, geopolitics um, and physical risk, we're looking at climate modeling and weather prediction and, uh, you know, social media as a field of discourse and volunteered information around events of concern around the world. So all of that kind of combines in GIS in ways that would be, I think, really overwhelming for us if we were trying to keep up with that in real time, given the scale of crisis, pace of crisis, the limited resources that humanitarian organizations have. We don't, you know, we have a relatively small staff that we use to um, use analytics to get out ahead of a lot of these issues, despite having a small staff. Um, and I think GIS has been kind of core to all of that. Well, well, that's really a fantastic overview, and I hope we can dive a little bit deeper into this. So data science is, of course, not only changing the availability of well data, just as Anna said, and the way you're doing your work, but it also comes with a lot of advanced methods, right? Big for data preparation, data cleaning, data visualization. So how much of data science, so to speak, is part of your daily workflows now? And how do you characterize this? I think data science is sort of like a daily part of our workflows now. I mean, everything that you mentioned, which some of that is maybe falls under data engineering. I mean, we deal with, um, having to clean our own data. We have transactional data on humanitarian shipments. We need to link that um, to uh, all of those external events that we just uh, that I was just talking about. Increasingly, we're looking at ways to get ahead of problems um, and to look at predictive models for uh, humanitarian logistics. So we confront this problem that's probably harder than what most business people have to deal with, which is what do people who don't have money to pay for things actually need? Um, and how much at what time? Uh, you know, there's no price signal. You have to infer this from who they are, where they are, what kind of events they're facing. Um, and yet, nevertheless, model as best as we can, uh, you know, what kind like specific amounts of pharmaceutical medicines, uh, supplies, other uh, you know things that kind of are meet their health needs are going to be uh, required at different intervals. So uh, I was talking to someone just over the weekend at an event I was speaking at about um, how we operate like a logistics business, like a, a any other kind of logistics business, but only with the added problem. Uh, that we actually have a higher standard than most logistics businesses because we don't just sort of like, you know, have a profit and loss column and call it good. We then actually also have to predict what happened as a result of it. How many people, you know, got better from a certain disease? How many people uh, had their lives saved? How many people are in a better health situation because of our activity? And that is like core to the data science enterprise for us. Fantastic. So. We are going to look into the future in a couple of questions, but now let's look at the past. So Anna, 
in in your in your routine, how has this changed over the past five years from you know the development of data science and the integration of data science into your daily routines? Right. Uh, well, you know, it has changed quite a lot. Um, not just five years ago. I I think I go back and think about you know my time in grad school fifteen years ago and the tools that I was using then and that now they are all you know web browser tools that anyone can access and you can run you know a million different analyses at the same time very quickly whereas back then it took me hours and hours so i think one of the things that has changed the most is just the efficiency and the accessibility of these tools um much more user friendly um and capable of doing a lot more and in less time so not just in like the particular gis space but um if you think about you know uh image segmentation or you know natural language models that can write something up for you really quick i mean all of that has changed drastically not just in the five past five years but <laughs> in just less than a year ago i would say you know we weren't even talking about these things and now we are Absolutely. And can you can you give us a few concrete examples of AI or machine learning methods that you guys are using? You already mentioned the, the language models that may help you draft something quickly, but I like that you also mentioned object segmentation. By the way, we 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 are GI scientists think this is a very GI sciencey thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so so what are some examples of AI and or ML work that, that you guys encounter or utilize? The, the image segmentation is an idea we're working on right now. So it would be lovely if people uh, would have ideas on this. Um, but, you know, we have a, for example, we have a, a global distribution program for access to refrigeration for people that are, um, you know, administering insulin, vaccination, uh, cancer programs, et cetera. They need to be able to keep material cold. And there are donors behind that in terms of the distribution of the material. They want to know things like, um, you know, how, uh, you know, what's the capacity uh, of this uh, refrigeration and how much of it's used at any given time. Traditionally, the way that you deal with that is to ask people, like survey them, have them fill out spreadsheets that say, like, I use this amount of this thing over time. This is torture. You know, it's just torture. Then most people uh, don't actually follow through on there's a in, in, there's a problem sector wide in terms of compliance with surveying and, and other kinds of uh, like things like inventory insight. So one of the things we thought was be maybe possible to do is to use uh images of the refrigeration to uh create a seg you know use image segmentation to extract how full of the, is the refrigerator what kinds of material are in there do this on a time series basis um ask less of the people that are there they're just basically asked to take a picture of what's in the what's in the refrigerator at a given time and then we use data analysis to do the rest of it to then be able to understand like you know, are you using this at 100% capacity, 90% capacity, 10% capacity? Are you uh, using it entirely for insulin or uh, maybe partially for vaccination, for other drugs? Um, you know, things that actually would be hard for us to get at, um, you know, by surveying people, um, we might be able to get at through AI and ML tools. I think the prediction on, um, uh, humanitarian demand uh, in, and resource allocation is also one of these things. We've been working with a, a group that we started collaborating with uh, for understanding um, refrigeration and power in the primary healthcare network in the state of California. So there's over 2,100 primary care sites in California. Nobody is actually tracking like how many refrigerators do they have? How many have solar panels? How many have backup power in the event that a wildfire takes their power system off offline. So, you know, we've tried surveying them. We get less than 10% response rate. We worked with the modeling team in that case to then say, well, let's, let's build a predictive model that includes computer vision for detection of solar panels, that includes publicly available information and corollary information to then anticipate what the uh, total 
sort of refrigeration power capacity of the primary care network would be. And then we're transferring the same methods over now into looking at prediction of what they need in terms of the drug supply. And that I think, although honestly, these are still in formation for us and we love feedback. So any, any ideas people have on ways to think about these in novel ways would be, a, 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 would be great. Um, but those are looking at ways that uh, artificial intelligence can actually help us to get ahead of the curve on our sort of core business practices. Well, let's talk about the, the, the elephant in the room here, and that's, of course, data, right? All of this is powered by data and access to high quality real time or near real time data is, of course, still very challenging. Either you don't have enough data, not of the right quality or you have too much data, which is equally bad, right? So what kind of data do you guys use on a daily basis? Where are you getting it from? And do you have strategies to manage and maintain the data? That's a good question. Uh, a lot of the data that we use is publicly available. So if, especially for our, our US-based analysis, uh, we have census data or CDC data we can use. Um, the federally qualified health centers, which act as uh, our primary care safety net in the United States, also publishes extensively yearly data sets on their activities and patient attributes. Um, but we're also branching out into other novel data sources, for example, partnering with private organizations such as Meta to receive anonymized user data for our mobility analysis. Um, or I think I heard somebody on one of those lightning talks talk about social media. So uh, working with other private organizations that use AI, for example, to sift through all those social media accounts and pull data that might be relevant to a disaster. So that's that is has been really helpful in terms of real time data as well and trying to get that situational analysis as events are unfolding. I mean, we also produce a lot of data. We um, uh, have a kind of highly complex uh, supply chain, probably 19,000 unique items flow through. Uh, our systems uh, on a yearly basis. Um, that's dramatically more than most uh, logistics organizations will deal with because we have such a wide variety of people that are uh, contributing to direct relief. Um, and, you know, we also do things like uh, remote sensing for uh, looking at damage assessment after disasters. This actually ties into the machine learning piece. There's, uh, you know, folks at Google and Microsoft that we've been talking to for some time about ways that we can apply their uh, post-disaster uh, damage assessment models to understand the specific impact on the health system. So in the Lahaina case, for instance, you saw Microsoft and Planet get out really early uh, and characterize every building that was destroyed by the fire through Lahaina. Um, similar work was done in the earth, after the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria. What we're interested in is obviously like the overall impact on every building, but even more so than that, uh, exactly which pharmacies, hospitals, uh, health clinics have been damaged. Can we estimate the proportion? And how does that relate uh, in addition to the kind of data that Anna was talking about in, with population? Uh, dynamics and census information to give us a better denominator on how many people are in need, uh, what is the change in the capacity to provide services, and how do we then channel, um, you know, goods effectively through supply chains that may be different depending on which part of the world we're talking about. You know, we run through Europe versus running through the United States. That's actually different supply chain conditions. So we have to link all of that together to make an effective uh, both demand forecast and aid shipment. Yeah, very, very interesting. It still strikes me that we are, we are used so in here in the US to deal with data rich environments. And you can now argue that even in other places, remote sense information can be, of course, used globally, but there's so much information on the ground, right? That is not easily available outside of the US. And even the remote sense data, we don't even know how many mines there are internationally, right? So just to give you one example. So I think there, there, there's a lot of really interesting stuff to do there. And I, I like it that you that you mentioned the, the social media before. So let me just let me just pick up on this. So what is the, the role of volunteer geographic information 
for your work and, and other relief organizations. Is this still a, a trusted, well-regarded alternative source of information? I think it depends, I mean, on which volunteer geographic information you're talking about. So, you know, I think early stages, you know, around when uh, the earthquake happened in Haiti uh, back in 2010, and that was sort of the heyday of Ushahidi and uh, crowdsourcing, um, there was a lot of energy around just the scale of data that could be collected, but a huge signal to noise problem. Um, I'm not sure that we've gotten a lot I mean, definitely there's been a lot of improvement in this over the years, but it still has trust problems. Um, this have never entirely gone away. Uh, there's bias throughout social media networks that arguably gets worse over time in some sort of key ways based on platform policy decisions. Um, we use the metadata actually, so that's maybe kind of an in-between piece. I mean, it's both volunteered and it's passively collected, so it's not entirely volunteered. So the mobility data through metadata is uh, based on people that have opted in through uh, location services and they have, uh, you know, they're still at a, at a, there's a lot of them. So the, you're just dealing with projections based on large sample sizes. Um, you know, we, we work with a, a, I worked with a group called uh, Balcony Labs uh, that does uh, what's called geo messaging services um, for response to the, uh, Afghanistan uh, evacuations and a number of other um, a number of other sort of sudden onset crisis conditions, and in those cases, we can, we're what we're doing is standing up a, a real time coordination network that involves being able to get people to volunteer their geographic information, um, and that can be of all different sizes of group. That can be like a a group of a, a four or five uh, hundreds. In the case of Afghanistan, we were helping hundreds of people to evacuate from Kabul following the Taliban's takeover. Uh, and all of this actually in part depended upon the capacity of individuals to volunteer geographic information into tools that allow us to do things with it, to communicate with them, to analyze where they are in time and space, to uh, provide resources that allow them to navigate their own space better. Um, so, yeah, it's complicated. Let me toss in a, a, an additional question that just appeared in the chat from uh, Mashiat. I hope I'm not butchering your name from Bangladesh University. How do you maintain the quality of data over time? What process do you use to calibrate data? And does AI give any extra benefits for data analytics or is it just overhyped? Anna, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think um, in terms of data quality, as I mentioned before, a lot of our um, fundamental, let's say, data sets are already uh, publicly available and they're through trusted sources. So um, one of the reasons that we keep using those data sets is because they are actually well maintained and of good quality over time. Um, I think uh, that doesn't mean that um, when we are collecting our own data or generating our own data, data that um, we don't go through a pretty intensive data cleaning process. Um, this is a conversation that we have all the time, <laughs> almost every day, is data cleaning. So um, just being mindful uh, that not all data is perfect and that it's important to have that understanding that um, you know things need to be critically analyzed before you even begin your your analysis right we have to have a good understanding of our data where it's coming from what biases might be in there and I think that's pretty standard across the field well you, you mentioned also large language models before so foundation models, for instance, in general, whether it's chat GDP that seems to be on everybody's mind or Delhi or whatever they are. And, and, and while I'm a big AI enthusiast, you, you know that, I, I also get a little bit scared that these are very normative technologies. And obviously you guys work with people who are situated geopolitically, economically and so forth on, on the borders of the spectrum, right? So the, the wealth of data doesn't represent them. So what are the risks of using these foundational models in, for instance, humanitarian relief in general? 
Well, you, I mean, I think you're absolutely right that, um, you know, you're talking about uh, biases inherent to the underlying social inequality that defines how data is collected about individuals around the world. So, uh, you know, in places where there isn't, for instance, a commercial interest in collecting a lot of data about people, we tend to have, uh, you know, data deserts that, uh, and then in other places, way too much data that's collected about other people. Um, so that is inherent to a lot of these, uh, to a lot of these bias problems. Um, and I would, I would say that is inherent to the large language model problem as well. There's a problem, I think, in language still persists, although I will say there's been a lot of work in improving language translation models. Um, I think that's actually quite promising. Uh, still, I think there's uh, too much bias towards the major languages of the world, English, uh, Spanish, Mandarin, um, and there's a, an enormous number of languages that people speak that are just completely ignored by a lot of these language models. Um, that also reflects the underlying biases that we were talking about before. So all of that you have to be very mindful as we uh, think of. I mean, I'm personally get a little freaked out now that like it seems like every online service I use is just harvesting everything for AI uh, generation. Um, so it's it's making it so that the decisions over how to engage on the internet are conditioned now in terms of the degree do you want your information to be processed for uh, uh, AI models um, and the ability to control that in any way seems largely beyond our capacity, which again is also a power dynamic issue when you talk about people that lack power in all kinds of other circumstances as well. Yeah, I agree. I think there's, you know, there's a term I saw recently, which was uh, becoming technology literate. So um, I think it's ever more relevant that we all, you know, not just understand the breadth of tools that are available to do our work, but to really understand, you know, how they were developed, you know, by whom, um, what what underlying data were they using to train their models? You know, uh, could they possibly be harmful or reinforce discriminatory, discriminatory biases? Um, so ha taking that uh, step back to uh, understand how this data or how these tools are working, I think it's really important and not just diving in and um, assuming that they are unbiased tools. Yep, uh, that's that's very well put. And before we move back to the to the excitement about technology, and I think most of us here are, are very positive and excited about technology. Let me let me ask one more doomsday question, and then and then we <laughs> we, we live on happy lives afterwards. So of course, you guys said that you have you have mostly clean data from trusted sources like the government or Meta that gives you access to Microsoft, and and gladly they do that. But there's also a larger context of data that may influence what you do, right? For instance, I'm, I'm, I'm working on conflict graphing right now or getting an interest in this, for instance, in Ukraine. And there's just so much misinformation, not just, you know, accidental misinformation, but trying to, to build an atmosphere where certain decisions can be taken or can't be taken. And I'm sure you also feel these pressures in different crises that you address, that you have to understand what is the the picture that the public believes to see about what is going on, right? So to what degree do you think about when you read the news, when you have to react to a crisis or, or when you plan your next shipment about fake news and bots and misinformation, especially with, with X, for instance, or Twitter? Really? Something happened with Twitter? Uh, no, I... <laughs> um, you know, I think one of the most important is just that uh, the uh, status of the image in humanitarian crisis is in fundamental doubt at this point. Um, when we live in a world where images can be uh, fabricated so easily, um, and, uh, you know, in any number of circumstances, satellite images can be fabricated. Uh, uh, you have to uh, begin every engagement with the image from a perspective, I think, of fundamental doubt um, and not of uh, believing in veracity as the default. 
And that I think is something that, I mean, there's a long history of this in understanding, you know, how, critique of the image, but um, it's it's just on just so much beyond what we're what we're used to these days. So uh, that that's a fundamental problem because evidence within human rights cases is is in many cases based on images. Um, uh, evidence of uh, the, of humanitarian need, a uh, situational analysis where you know a building may have been bombed or a flood may have gone. These are often initial evidence based on images. If all of that can be so easily fabricated, um, you know, we, I mean, we, and honestly, we're already working under time pressure. I don't necessarily have a ton of time to sift through all kinds of garbage that is coming through the internet uh, that's being uh, potentially subjected to fabrication, if that's intentional or otherwise, you know, that's uh, might be a, 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 a bad actor attempting to influence a situation. Um, it, it's a huge problem that I don't really have an answer for, honestly. I, I think it's also the, the speed with which this has happened is so sudden and rapid, uh, the acceleration that uh, I don't think we have good answers for it yet. Maybe you do. I don't, I don't, I know I don't. No, I definitely don't have a good answer. To, I, I'd probably be very wealthy if I had an answer to that. <laughs> Yeah, it goes back to this interesting term that was coined a couple of years of the the, uh, the bullshit asymmetry principle, right? That it's so much faster to create misinformation than it is to to check what is misinformation and what isn't. And now with the ability to to generate images, and as we said, images are so strong, right? It's what you see in the media, the single image of something happens that then opens the purses of people and, and many relief organizations, I guess, I guess really do depend on that, right? It's also an issue of trauma. As I said, I, I, I looked really deeply into some of the, the conflict mapping tools and how people do this over time. So all these communities form in open source intelligence and basically it's people coming then really burning out through trauma so by looking at these images and then disappearing and now if they suddenly have to look at like 10 times the data that you know it's a it's a tough it's a tough world okay now to to to, to enough with the gloomy topics we have a lot of students listening and we want all of them to be excited about technology and their work so i know that you guys of course are also involved in our nsf funded nowhere graph project right that develops a geographic knowledge graph for environmental intelligence with applications, for instance, also in humanitarian relief. So can you tell us a little bit about the lessons learned from working with such a knowledge graph? And of course, our graph isn't the only one that you work with, also the guys from, from S3 and, and you are working together. So what is your thinking about knowledge graphs for your work and where do you see further potential? Uh, working with uh, KWG has really opened our eyes to the power of knowledge graphs and the potential they have for enhancing our work um, in terms of vulnerability analysis and situational awareness during emergencies. The ability of a graph to join multiple large data sets at once and convey the relationships between those data is really fascinating. Uh, when I first joined the project, I knew nothing about knowledge graphs, um, and now I can hardly imagine going forward with our work without the use of, of this technology. So um, with the KWG project, we, um, we developed a graph that would connect disaster data to vulnerability population and health data, and then also relay relevant health experts who we could contact to improve our understanding of those health vulnerabilities at that moment, right? So um, the potential in graphs really lies in the time savings uh, capabilities and the new insights that they're capable of um, to take so many disparate data sets and return useful information in a fraction of the time, um, I think is just really amazing as and has been fascinating to learn about. I, I agree with all of that. I also would add the um, role of data discovery in graphs has been, I think, really remarkable. Um, you know, there's a, a work that the KWG team has done on geo enrichment that we've been spending some time really understanding the implications for our own work. Um, you know, to me, the significance of that is being able to, and I remember this from like an early conversation with Yano uh, about the KWG project, like being able to say, look at, an area that's been impacted by a wildfire and then understand that 
there's an enormous depth of data available at any given place where that wildfire has occurred, which is, you know, the, the soil composition, the historical impact of events, the people that live there, the built environment, et cetera, et cetera, we could go on. Um, and that there is no such place right now where that depth of data discovery is actually, you know, made accessible, made, um, you know, uh, openly available to a range of actors uh, without actually undergoing like a perpetual research project, right? Uh, that can be integrated into workflows. And that to me, it sounds maybe a little mundane to think about data search as part of what is uh, really exciting, but I actually would disagree with that. I think that it really is profoundly important um, to be able to see that enormous depth of, of data that is available that only becomes useful when we sort of like graph it together and, and make that, um, you know, something that has a, a, a product status to it. So. I, I totally agree. And I think it's so interesting that since since the 80s, we are stuck in whether this is geographic information systems or data analytics more broadly in this idea of layers, right? Every data set comes as layer. And this idea of layers is so hard, book, hard, you know, coded in our textbooks and thinking. And then you combine the layers, the layers we know how to share. This is open data, right? But we don't know how to share the connections between the layers, right? The knowledge graphs break apart this, this idea that really overstates its welcome of layers of data, but looks at the connection between those layers, right? So I'm also, also very, very excited about this. So, so given uh, today's audience, what do you think are the spatial data science, GUAI, knowledge graph, spatial stats areas, and so on, that you guys from your insights would encourage students to, to work on, for instance, for a master's thesis? Oh, this is a tough question. It makes me feel old. <laughs> Maybe, yes, well. <laughs> um, I think there's just so much going on in spatial data science and GOAI at the moment, and things are changing so fast. Um, and, you know, from a developer point of view, like I don't know so much, but I, I can say that the demand for these types of technologies are huge and that the applications are really countless. Um, if you're more like me um, on the user end, and want to apply these technologies to your work or use them as tools for your own insights. I still think it's important really to have that basic understanding of you know, data science and spatial data and, and you know, GIS. The new tools are really powerful, but you can't really be a critical thinker of how these tools are working if you don't have that basic understanding of data science and spatial science. So um, I, I'd say like the classics are, <laughs> are still really important in that sense. Um, and of course, if you're working in the humanitarian field or um, anything that might involve understanding populations, um, of course, you need to be able, you have to have an understanding or be able to learn about the social political context that you're working at in and the cultural context in order to understand how those tools that you are applying and using um, can affect those populations that you're trying to support. Yeah, I agree with all of that. And I would, you know, maybe just amplify the last point around um, the need for local context in whatever you're doing. I think often there's a tendency to think that methodological abstraction can sort of be good. I think if you could repeat the last sentence, at least for me, your mm -hmm. audio was, was gone and looking, judging but Anna's face for her as well. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, the way that the KWG project has actually proceeded was to, uh, you know, not just engage in modeling, but to engage with, um, you know, a range of people that are working very close to the field on these issues so that there's a constant give and take between methodology, modeling, innovation in uh, the sort of science and uh, really understanding 
at, at as deep a level as possible the problem space that you're working in and because i think without that things get uh too uh you, you tend to go astray um and people uh, may not use the work um they may uh, it, it may not be appropriate to the problem that you're trying to solve. So that that dialogue, I think, is really crucial to maintain at all points. Yeah, it, 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 I think you always put these things better than I do. But this is like the PI model of data science instead of the T model of classical science. You need to have two areas of, of you know expertise, so to speak, and one has to be really the the domain area, either on your side or by talking to people really closely. And so we are we are almost out of time. And I thought maybe a last question would be one where where we are free or you are free to to speculate. So we looked a little bit into the past. We talked a little about the present. So five years, or maybe let's be let's be bold. Ten years from now, what kind of crisis do you expect, and will technology help to solve or cause it? Oh, goodness, Yano, you want to do that as the last question? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I would say climate is the key, yeah. is the key one, um, which is sort of the crisis of crises. Um, and uh, obviously, technology is to some degree causing the climate crisis, given uh, that it's associated with uh, economic growth and development in uh, you know a mode that's petroleum intensive. Um, and there's a way out of this that is also potentially driven by technology, um, you know, from data to material science to, uh, you, you know, a, a, a energy generation, etc. So I think this space, um, in terms of cause and benefit, uh, is, is probably the, the best way to think about this sort of duality of technology and social problems. Um, you know, I, I think the other way, the other thing that we're going to have to think about and kind of alluded to it earlier and with your data overload problem is just that the world is going to get a lot more virtual uh, over time. And we don't actually know how to live in that world, I think. Um, you know, we don't uh, know how to, you know, car navigate our way through a lot of the, these complexities around what is real and what is not real, how to trust it. Um, we're sort of doing on the job training on all of these sort of fundamental existential questions. And I think that's going to become a lot more serious as we uh, as we move forward. Um, and that has lots of humanitarian context as well. So, um, you know, we're we're doing our best, but I think that's going to be a huge issue. Anna, what do you think? Yeah, I agree that climate change is is really going to be the driver of um, the biggest disasters that we see in you know 10 years from now. Um, and those disasters are more likely to just become more complex um, as they start happening perhaps at the same time, you know, having wildfires and hurricanes and heat waves all occurring at the same time, uh, people being displaced, but then you factor in mass migration from different parts of the world. Um, and of course, technology can help us, you know, I, I, I know it will be important uh, for helping us understand all those dynamics, um, but, you know, you also have to consider that maybe some of the most vulnerable people will be increasingly isolated from these technologies and the flow of information and how the lack of information might be uh, creating increasing vulnerabilities in certain parts of the world. So um, I, I know it's going to be very challenging in the humanitarian space, um, but I, I can only hope that some of these um, analytic tools and tools that are giving us insight can help us do a better job well I'm, I'm i'm very optimistic about the state of things if you guys believe that that climate is the 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 biggest problem and I'm, I'm, I'm i hope it it really is well that was absolutely fantastic i could listen to you guys and i'm sure everybody else all day long every time i talk to you there are so many ideas for for masters student and phd student theses i wish i would be I would be 20 again. I would have gotten so much out of listening to you guys. I hope you will be available a little bit if people want to reach out. Um, and then Andrew do absolutely fantastic work, of course, at Direct Relief, but also as you know, people living both worlds, the technology world and the, the, the domain or the humanitarian aid work. So they have been a fantastic team to work with and would be a great resource, I think, for all of us here. And I think we reached the end of our session and we are going to take a break. 
and then uh, talk to all of you again after that i know it's getting really late for some of you so i'm really appreciative of so many of you still being with us thanks again anna thanks again andrew and and see you guys in a couple of minutes thank, thank you, you anna.